Thanks to Shaper 3D for sponsoring this video. All right, guys, welcome back to our third video in our Shaper 3D beginner tutorial series. And in this video, we're gonna be talking about what I think are the 10 most important solid tools to use for designing furniture inside Shaper 3D. And by the end of the video, you should be able to use these tools efficiently for your own designs. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume that you already know how to navigate the workspace and how to create your own sketches. But if you do need a refresher for that, be sure to check out the first two videos in this series. Um, and as always, I gotta let you guys know if you're looking to upgrade to the pro version of Shaper 3D, you can get 10% off by using my code Bevelish Creations 10 at checkout. Um, okay, so as I mentioned in the last video, all of these solid tools can be found under the tools drop down menu on the left over here. And we actually talked about some of these in the previous video as well. And the first one I wanna talk to you guys about is probably the easiest one to use, and also it's the one that we're gonna use the most often. And that is the extrude tool, which is used for creating 3D geometry by pushing or pulling on our 2D sketches. And also I mentioned in the last video that for us to use this tool, our sketches need to be closed. And we know that a sketch is closed if we see this translucent blue fill inside of our sketch. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and select it. And now we just need to click on the blue surface of our sketch. And then we can push or pull in either direction to create the 3D geometry. And also we can use this other arrow to change the drag angle of our extrusion like that. So yeah, this can be something like uh, one of the panels for a cabinet that we're building. Another way to use this tool is actually just by clicking on the blue surface of our sketch, which automatically activates the extrude tool and bring up the arrows that we need. So we don't actually need to click on the tool first before we're able to use it. Um, yeah, like I said, this is probably the simplest tool to use and also the one that we're gonna use the most often. Um, another tool that's really similar to the extrude tool is the offset face tool. And the main difference between these two is that the offset face tool can only be used on the face of a 3D body. So we can't use it to do anything to 2D sketches. And the second difference is when we offset a face, the adjacent faces will also update with it. Um, so what that means is if we pick this top face on the leg that we just extruded earlier, which automatically activates the offset face tool and bring up this arrow. And if we pull up on this arrow, you can see that the adjacent faces are moving up with it so that it maintains the angles between these three faces. But let's undo that and let's select that face again, except this time we're gonna choose the extrude tool. And if we pull up on that arrow, you can see that it's not changing the size of that profile. And it's also completely ignoring the adjacent faces as well. Um, so for this example, if we're just looking to change the size of this leg without changing the relationship between these faces, then the offset face tool is the one that we wanna use. However, if we're looking to create a new shape from existing face, so that later maybe we can use this shape to create an angle tenon or something like that, then the extrude tool is the one that we want to use. Um, another tool I want to talk to you guys about that we covered in my previous video was the chamfer fillet tool, which I also use a lot, especially for designing cabinets that have miter joints or if I need to add bevels or roundovers to stuff. So to use this tool, let's go back to this panel that we made earlier. And let's say that we need to add a bevel along this edge right here. And all we need to do is pick this edge, which will automatically activate the chamfer fillet tool and bring up this arrow. And now we just need to grab this arrow and push it into the body to create our chamfer. And we can also change the angle of this chamfer by holding down the shift key on the keyboard. And we want to pick the face that we just created along with the edge that we want to rotate that face about. So once we do that, we'll get this arrow that we can grab and change this angle in either direction, just like that. Um, okay, so to create a roundover, the process is exactly the same. So let's do it along this edge right here. We just need to select this edge, but this time instead of pushing that arrow into the body, we're gonna pull it away from the body to create that round over. And we can click on this text box right here to change the radius of that round over. So yeah, this tool right here is just a really quick way for us to generate round overs and chamfers without us having to create sketches that we then need to cut away from the main body. Um, okay, so let's deselect that. And the next tool I wanna talk to you guys about 
is the loft tool, which is used for creating smooth transitions between different cross sections. And we usually end up with these like really fluid and complex shapes. And for that reason, it's not a tool that I use a whole lot, especially for the type of things I design, but there are instances where we need it. And one of those instances is when we need to create those cylindrical taper legs in mid-century modern type furniture. And it's really easy to do with the loft tool. So basically all we need are two circles. So a bigger circle for the top of the leg and a smaller one for the bottom of the leg. And let's go ahead and pick our loft tool. And to use this tool, all we need to do is select the two profiles that we need to connect together and that's it. Um, yeah, let's click done to finish that up. So yeah, this is usually what I use the loft tool for, but where I find this tool to really shine is when I need to make something for the shop, like nozzles or adapters for my dust collection system. Um, so let's say that we made some measurements and we figured out that we need an adapter with one end that looks like this and another end that looks like that. And we can now use the loft tool to connect these two profiles to come up with this really nice smooth transition. And we can further tweak this transition by playing around with these anchor points right here. Um, yeah, let's put that back and click done. So while we're here, and since this is supposed to be like an adapter or nozzle, I want to show you guys another tool, and that is the shell tool. And this is just a really quick way for us to hollow out a 3D body. So to use this tool, we want to select the two faces that we want to remove. So the front and back faces of this guy. And then we can use this arrow to define the thickness of our wall. So let's make that three millimeters and click Done. Yeah, there we go. So like I said, these two tools aren't something I use a whole lot in terms of furniture design, but you can see it's got a lot of value in terms of creating this sort of thing for the shop. Um, but the next tool I want to talk to you guys about is something that is extremely useful, and that is the sweep tool right here, which lets us extrude the profile along a given path and not just linearly like the extrude tool does. So basically to use this tool, we need to first pick the profile that we want to extrude which in this example is the circle and click next and now we need to select the path that we want this profile to follow which are these lines and since we have several different segments we have to select them individually i kind of hope that in the future shaper 3d will let us to just pick one line and it'll select the entire thing since everything's tangent um, but yeah for now we have to do it individually so what I find that this tool is really useful for, for furniture design, is when we need to model something that have a profile around the part. So something like one of those shaker style door panels or drawer fronts, which uh, is basically just a flat panel that's recessed into a decorative trim around it. So for this example, we've got our panel right here, and then the profile of the trim that I sketched out that's gonna go around this panel. And you can see that the panel is gonna sit inside this mortise right here here. Um, so let's go ahead and use our sweep tool and we're going to select the profile, click next and then go around picking the edges of our door. And there we go. So if you're looking to create drawer fronts or doors like this, the sweep tool is perfect for it. Um, another thing that this tool is really good for is making hairpin legs. I'm gonna make a separate tutorial video on exactly how I made all these sketches and constraints to define the angles and height of this leg because it's kind of beyond the scope of this video. Right now, I just wanna show you what we can use the sweep tool for. So let's go ahead and pick our sweep tool, which uh, right here, um, and we're gonna first pick this circle right here for the profile that we want to sweep click next and then we're gonna go through and click the path of our rod like that and click done and here is our hairpin leg now one problem with doing it this way because of this angle of the sweep is that if we zoom in here you can see that this end of the rod is not matching up with the top face of our base plate which leads us to talking about the next tool which is a huge one and that's going to be the replace face down here which is a really interesting tool that i started using on every single project once i discovered it because the purpose of this tool is to match the face of one object to the face of another object. So the way to use this tool on our hairpin leg, we're gonna first pick the face that we wanna modify, which is the end of this rod. 
And then we're gonna pick the face that we want to match to, which is the top face of this plate, and click done. And you see how that rod just matched up to the plate? Um, so this tool doesn't just match the angle of two flat faces. Uh, let's go back to the taper leg that we made earlier, right here. So usually when we create legs like this for furniture, we also need to make a stretcher to help stabilize them. So I already made a profile of a stretcher over here and let's just extrude that to some random value. And we're gonna use the replace face tool on this. So first we're gonna select the face of our stretcher and then we're gonna pick the face of our leg and click done. So you can see here that it not only extended our extrusion to meet up with the leg, but it also matched up the shape of the stretcher to the leg. So yeah, with this tool, there's no need to calculate anything, no need to create any shapes to trim away our parts. This is an extremely useful tool for modeling furniture. So anytime you wanna match up one part to another part that maybe have a complex shape, like the arm of a chair, this is a tool that you wanna use. All right, so now I wanna switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the tools under the transform drop-down menu. And we'll start by talking about the pattern tool, which lets us create patterns of 2D sketches and 3D bodies. So let's go ahead and select that. And the first thing you notice is that there's this little triangle on the bottom right corner, which means that there is an additional drop-down menu. So if we click on that, you can see that we have the option to create linear patterns as well as circular patterns. Um, we're gonna start with the linear pattern first. And the way to use this tool is we want to start by selecting the part that we want to duplicate. So let's double click on this part to select it. And now the program is going to ask us a few things. The first is which direction we want to create a pattern in. So if we want to create a pattern in this direction, we just grab this arrow and drag it in that direction. Next, we have to choose how we want to define our pattern. And we have a couple options. So the default option is by total distance, meaning that we're gonna set the distance between the first part and the last part. So let's uh, change that distance to, I don't know, 500. And let's zoom out a little bit. And next, we get to define how many total parts we want. So let's change that to, I don't know, 10. And now you see the program just gave us 10 equally spaced parts within the distance that we defined earlier. So this is a good option to use for when we know the total distance of the pattern that we wanna make. And this is the option I use for when I model the slatted doors for the media console that I built a few months back. And additionally, we can also create patterns in multiple directions. So we already went in this direction, but we can grab this arrow and create another pattern of this pattern in the other direction. And just like before, we have the same options to choose from, so we can define the pattern by either total distance or spacing distance, as well as the quantity. So let's go with uh, spacing distance this time, which basically allows us to define the spacing between these parts. So let's do like 100 for that, and we'll do five instead. So you can see the total length of our pattern is gonna change depending on our quantity because this time we're defining it by the spacing between these parts. Um, so usually for what I do, I never define the patterns using spacing distance, but you know, it's there if you need it. Um, okay, let's um, cancel that and let's check out the circular pattern this time, which obviously it lets us create a circular pattern around a center point. Um, so similar to before, let's double click on the part that we want to duplicate. And this time we want to grab this midpoint and drag it to where we want that center of the pattern to be. Um, I don't really have anywhere to put it, so I'm just gonna drop it right here. And we're gonna define the direction of our pattern by dragging one of these arrows. Um, and this time we can define the pattern by either the total angle or the spacing angle. So if we wanted to form a full circle, we would just change the total angle to 360 degrees. And then here we can set the total number of parts. So let's do 10 again. Um, so, so far it's pretty similar to the linear pattern, but this time we have an additional option here called circular orientation, which lets us define how we want all of these parts to be oriented in this pattern. Um, so if we go to a top view so we can see it better, 
So by default, the rotated orientation is selected, meaning that each of these parts are oriented the same way relative to the center point. But if we choose uniform, then all of the parts are oriented the same way as the original part. Um, so yeah, usually for what I do, I stick with the linear pattern. And like I said earlier, that's what I use for modeling the slatted doors on the media console I built, as well as the slats for the crib that I built years ago. Finally, I wanna to talk to you guys about the translate and align tools, which gives us two different ways to move parts and sketches in a more precise way than if we just double clicked on a part and dragged them around using these arrows. So the way that the translate tool works is by defining a start point and an end point. So let's say that we have these two parts. One is a stretcher and the other one is a leg and they're gonna to join together with a bridle joint. So we're gonna start by double clicking on the part that we wanna move, which is the stretcher and click next and we're going to pick a starting point that we want to move which is this top right corner of this tenon and then we're going to select the end point which is this top right corner of the mortise and click done and there we go all right now the align tool is kind of like a specialized version of the translate tool and what i mean by that is align will always snap two parts together about the midpoint of the features that we choose let's undo this real quick and we're going to choose the align tool this time Time. And just like before, we're going to select the part that we want to move first, click next, and then we're going to pick the feature that we want to align. So it's going to be this bottom edge of our tenon, and then we're going to select our target edge, which is going to be the bottom edge of this mortise, and click done. So pretty easy to use, right? But now let's say that we have these two panels here and they're different sizes and we want them to match up on their mitered ends. So let's go ahead and use the align tool again. So let's pick this red panel to move, select next, and then let's select this face to align and then the target face will be this one right here. And you see automatically these two parts are snapped together at the midpoints of the two faces that we picked. But let's say that this is not where we want this red panel and we want the front edges to match up. And we can do that by grabbing this arrow and dragging it forward until the front edges snap together like that. And we can also use this arrow to rotate the part around and use this arrow to slide it up and down along the faces. So yeah, with the align function, we have different ways to tweak the alignment if the initial operation isn't quite what we want. Um, so for me, I usually like to use the align tool because for furniture design, most of the time the features that touch each other, they're the same size. So the align tool is just a lot quicker to use, but you know, for times when things are just not aligning properly then the translate tool is there okay so i'm gonna end the video here obviously i didn't go into every single tool but i just wanted to give you guys an overview of the ones that i think are most important for furniture design and get you guys started obviously later down the road we're gonna start modeling some furniture pieces and you can see how all these tools come together as well as learn how to use some of the other tools um once again i hope you guys enjoyed this video and i will see you or hope to see you guys in the next video